about this for this year, of what God would have me speak on. And uh, it's found in uh, Psalms 115. And I cannot get that out of my spirit with our dear brother during the revival we had, Brother Ted Shows with Junior. Violent increase for 2020. Yes. Violent increase. And I believe it. And I'm speaking it over you and over me. And that's found in Psalm 115, verse 13 through 14. And it reads, He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. Let's stop there and say that a little slower. May the Lord, say with me, may the Lord give you increase more and more. Everybody say more and more. More and more. Say it again. More and more. That means every day it's going to increase, that tomorrow's going to be better than yesterday. The end of next month's going to be better than this month. I promise you it's more and more. That the Lord will increase you. Who's going to increase you? The Lord. More and more. Now watch this. And you and your children. And you, that you may be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. I'm telling you what God wants us to do is to step into increase. So what God's given me is five keys for divine increase. And I got this on my own. And my points are not other people's points. And I don't even ever heard this on increase before. But I don't care. This is what God gave me. So I'm going to give it out. Amen? Amen. And so let's pray. Father, make alive the word. Holy Ghost, we sense you so powerfully. It's a house of freedom, a house of joy, a house of triumph, a house of, house of victory, a house of faith. Open your word. Make it alive. Let it so touch our heart that it changes how we think and act so we can change what we receive in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Now, the point one, you have to come every Sunday to get the other points. <laughs> and I, I won't even list them because I want to keep it as, as a surprise. I told you before, at the beginning of the year, you need to make January a test month for your life. Come when you can. I realize some of you work. I realize some of you have got things going on. But make it a decision in the month of January that you're going to be here whenever the doors open, particularly on Sunday. Just come. Just show up. Because you'll understand when I finish this sermon why I said that. It's important for your own spiritual well-being and growth. Because I believe this, that the church is not like any other body of believers. It's more than information. You capture inspiration. You capture the anointing and also spiritual transformation, I believe, goes on the house. Because when you honor God, you honor the house. When you honor the house, God will honor you. Does that make sense? And I always say this in the, in the Bible. You could lock yourself in the closet. I'm getting all mine from God. You're a fool. You're not that smart. Because otherwise, you're saying God's a fool. Because God said, you need a pastor and you need a teacher, and you need an evangelist, and you need a prophet, and you need an apostle. So what God says, you cannot dig up all the potatoes out of the field yourself. You have to have other people help you get it. In fact, I believe God will withhold revelations. You'll never get it until you sit on someone else. And because I believe this, God will keep us, he, he makes us dependent on one another. He makes us so that I need what you have, but you need what I have. And it's a wonderful thing. It's called the body of Christ. Amen? Amen? So, you say, what's the point? Get to it. Well, let me just build up a little bit. <laughs> you see, I believe God has increased for every person here today. Increase in what, area, in what area, you might say. Well, number one, spiritually. You need to grow spiritually. You need to grow in your anointing, grow in your revelation. Then you need to be touched by the God physically. You want to get every, you, you want to increase in your health that you have divine energy to get what he's called you to do. Amen? Yeah. Uncle Arthur, Rice needs to go. We need to get everything that's off you that slows you down. It needs to get out of your body in Jesus' name. And I believe God will do it if you look to him and say, God, I've got things to do for you. I need your strength to do it. He'll give you physical well-being. He will bless you. Listen, man, he'll increase you financially. God can do that supernaturally. We've got to start thinking increase. 
Stop believing God for big things. And then God wants to help you relationally. He wants to help you with your marriage. He wants to increase your marriage. Wherever your marriage is, He wants to take it to another level. And whatever relationship you have with your kids, He wants to go to another level. Just relationally, all the way around, God has increased for you. In every area, that's what God's will is. It's never, never the plan of God for you to live in lack. That's never God's plan for you to live depressed, never lack to live sick. I promise you this, God's word says that he wants to bless you. And to bless you means to be empowered to prosper, empowered to multiply, empowered to excel, empowered to break through barriers that hold other people back, but they don't hold you back because you've got the power of God behind you. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm telling you something, God is a good God. He wants to bless you. He wants to increase you. And everybody's so excited about that. But what are the five keys, Pastor? Give me the first key because I want to get going on this sermon. I'm so glad you're asking those questions. <laughs> this first key is going to sound simple. And you may go, what's that about? But if you listen, you'll understand. First key that unlocks God's increase. Love God. Amen. They say, what do you mean, love, love God? I love God. I love God. I love ice cream. I love the V, the varsity hot dogs and hamburgers, especially the fries. That cholesterol bomb they sell you. But in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, I wrote it wrong when I was writing, and I messed everybody up the first service. They were looking for this gospel that didn't have it corresponding verse. 22, verse 37. Listen to what the word says. And listen to it with fresh ears. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God. The man asked him, what's the great commandment? Here's Jesus answering, what's the great commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Verse 38, this is the first, everybody say first. first. This is the first and great, everybody say great. great. So Jesus said this is the first commandment and this is the great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now this is a commandment that God gave. Jesus reiterated it, but I want a slow drive by, a slow drive by to help you take it all in. He said, this is the first, protos in the Greek, before anything else, before anything else you talk about, anything else you say above all obligations and preferences and commandments, this is the number one thing that God is looking for. The first, this commandment right here. And then secondly, it says, and it's the greatest. That word in the Greek means megas, but we get the word mega, mega. This is big. This is bigger than anything else you can wrap your head around. It's the first. It's the greatest. And then he says it's a command. Look, the word of commandment is a charge. It's an order. If you have a police car behind you with blue lights, it's not a free Christmas light show on the side. <laughs> it's for you to do something to pull over. I mentioned the first service, no, nothing intended on this, but Tessa, my daughter, is always being pulled over by blue lights for something. <laughs> we were coming home from a, a dinner or something we did together, and she's in another car, and she's beside me, and we see a police car. I said, I just told us, watch this. Pretty soon, the lights come on. I said, there we go, praise God. It's something, I don't know what it is. Found out she didn't take an indicator light to go to the left lane or right lane, and then there's a light bulb out. But you know, Tess has so much favor on her life that they pull her over every other day. <laughs> but they always let her off. They always let her off. She's got more warning tickets. She got a box full. Praise God, I got the favor of God. A, but. You know, it's an order. When God orders, this is not a, not a suggestion. I'm commanding you to do this. It's an order that you love me. And so we've got to understand the significance of it because everything, he says, on this, the whole law hangs. Everything hinges on this one command. One command. 
He said, if you get this right, everything else comes right. Just with this command. It's so simple. It's so simple, we miss it. We've got to drill down and understand what he's saying. Meaning that the love of God supersedes everything else. The love of God is the fountainhead. And Amplified puts it this way. It says, love God with everything you have. Let's break it down. He says, love God with all of your heart. And we know your heart is your spirit. And I love what the Passion Bible says. Because I'm passionate about the Passion Bible. <laughs> it uses the word passion a whole lot. I see why they call it the Passion Bible. But that same verse, they translate, love the Lord God with every passion of your heart. In, with all the energy of your heart. And with every thought that is within you. Now Mark and Luke list the same scripture and they add one other word, with all your strength. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Well, my goodness, if you love God with all of that, what's left? Not much. That's the consuming power God wants us to have. This is like super strong. This is like God saying, I want you to love me every day with every fiber of your being. That everything you do in life is based on, is this pleasing to God? Am I showing love to God? It's, it really is pedal to the metal, you know, where you push it down to the floorboard. Some men know what I'm talking about, others have never experienced that. <laughs> but I had a chance this week, I'm going, once a week I'm going to, I'm finding a business, I'm going to the business and going there and praying a blessing on the business. So in this business, this last week, and the man had bought a, a Viper. He said, would you like a ride? I said, sure. I knew I was in for a ride when I got in that thing and the seat belts were like four inches across and they clipped four of them in the center piece and he had to snug it real tight. <clears throat> About 800 horsepower. So when he hit that thing, we were, now listen, I'm gonna, this is a disclaimer. You'll never know where this was. You'll never know what time of day it was. And if, you, if, if, if I'm interviewed, I know nothing. So don't try to figure this out. And don't do this yourself. But within about 100 yards, I'm not kidding, we're at over 150 miles an hour. How many know that there's nothing can touch it? Not your Chevy, not your, <laughs> not your Toyota, even your Lexus. Give me a living break. And so, but I loved it because to, to get there, you had to do a pedal to the middle. Just give it everything you got. I loved it. And then we ended up going in the cul-de-sac and pulling one giant donut for about four times, and there was so much smoke, I thought I was in a James Bond movie. <laughs> that car was like borderline scary, but I'm here to tell the tale. But God wants you to love him with that intensity all of your heart. Because you see something, this commandment is come from the beginning of time. It came out of God's heart. This commandment is the, is the basis of, of the new covenant. Everything we believe in the New Testament is based on this commandment. The intense love for God. And we've got to understand that the foundation of everything we do, like, why do you get up and pray? should be for love for God. Why do you read your Bible? Because you want to you love God better. Why come to church? You show God love. Why even give your money? That's why I believe it's the foundation. We know God will bless you when you give, but let me say this. There's something before that. You give because you love God. Whether he never gave you a dime back, you give because you love God. Amen. It's the truth. You gotta get that. And no matter what you do for others, you gotta be constantly asking, is this pleasing to God? Am I pleasing God? Because God watches everything. Is this pleasing to God? And when you burn in your heart with love for God, and as it grows in your heart, you wanna be more and more pleasing in Jesus' name. And so really, you could measure your love for God by what you do. 
Your giving is a reflection of your love for God. Your service is a reflection of your love for God. Your time with God is a reflection of your love for God. And you can say you love God, but God's from Missouri. He says, show me. The show me state, my wife's state, show me. I don't know how a state got that kind of motto. I guess they, if you're flat land in the middle of the America, there's nothing else to say than show me. Amen. <laughs> but it's a command that is indispensable for life. And it's a command of all the commands that you need to adhere to in this life. And it will be with you for all eternity that you will love God with all your heart. Jesus goes on to talk about God's love for people. I mean, love for people loving him, his creation. In John chapter 4, where he talks about the woman at the well, there's a conversation they were having, talking about worship. And worship is an expression of man's spirit to God. The word worship means to kiss towards. To worship means that you willingly bow down and give ob obeisance. You show reverence to God. And she was talking about where you worship, but Jesus kind of cleared the deck. He said, listen, God's looking for people who really love him. He's really looking for that kind of person. Meaning that they're not that common. Everybody wants the handouts from God. What can you give me? But God says, no, listen, the first rule is you've got to love me for who I am. An all-consuming love. And he told the woman, he said, listen, the Lord, the Father is looking for those that worship him in spirit and in truth. Me, that is from your heart, deep within the inner recesses. When you worship God, it's your inner man. Psalm 103, one says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. So he's looking for the zenith of people loving him, which is the expression of love and worship to him. And so we got to be so careful because you come to church and you can step into the familiar lane. Well, I know that song. Or you're checking out the worship leader's clothes. Where do you get those shoes? <laughs> What's with Joe Whitehead's boots? <laughs> and why is he wearing a coat under a coat? <laughs> it's because he's a millennial. I said in the first service, I might have to try to catch up in Jesus' name. I'm giving me some boots, a leather coat with some studs on it. But I'm not quite sure about the earring. That may go, people might think I lost my mind. But, I, but my point is, my point is, we've got to be so careful when you come to the house. You can worship God in your house, and you should. But you need to come to worship God corporately. Corporate worship. Corporate worship. And it's the expression of your, of your love. So I've said this before, but um, worship begins at nine. You need to make your effort to get here for worship. And then you need to effort to enter into worship. Don't look at your watch. Put your phone down. Quit looking around. Actually, we've got these big screens up here so you can look them and look over everyone's heads and just focus. And maybe once you've got the words, close your eyes and focus and say, God, help me to love you with everything that's in me. Because heaven is a picture of people loving God. In Revelation 5, it says, Behold, I heard the voices of a multitude of angels. He talks about, and the four living creatures, and the 24 elders. And that multitude, he uses these words, this multitude was 10,000 times 10,000. And thousands upon thousands that begin to say with a loud voice, you are worthy, O God, to receive glory and honor and power. 
And he goes down the line. All through the book of Revelation, people are pouring out their adoration to God out of honoring the one who loved them. But then God said, I created you to love me. You love him with all of your heart. And then the Bible says, to love God with all of your soul. Your soul. You know, it says, we are just emotional. Hello? God made emotions. Why do you always scream at church? Do you have to shout hallelujah? Listen, I came from my background. The loudest volume that we got out of anybody was a hmm. You weren't allowed to do any more than a hmm. One time in my life, before I left this church, before I got the right foot of fellowship, I mean the right foot of fellowship, I was singing and sitting in a service. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And this woman sang this solo. They didn't know it, but she was filled with the Holy Spirit just recently. And when she sang a song, the power of God came down. And I let out. I forgot about the hmm. I let out a hallelujah. Just one. I went, hallelujah. You thought I shot a gun off. Ushers were looking to find out who said hallelujah. The, the man in the robes stood up there and kind of looked around. Who is this hallelujah person? And I realized this, I was in the wrong company. I have to get around a company where you don't say hallelujah and then look have to duck. You can say hallelujah in this house as loud as you want to. You can dance here. I don't care if you get up here and dance. You can dance up and down the aisle. I don't care if you hang from the balcony. If you do it for the glory of God. We're going to have a good time. We're going to shout and praise our God. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says about David, and I believe this is why God loved David so much. Well, he slept with a woman's wife. We know. He, I mean, a man's wife. <laughs> Let me make a disclaimer. I, 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 I've, I, I've been in Atlanta too long. That's what I... <laughs> it's, I got a, it's a little bit too long in this city. Uh, Nebraska, here I come. But anyway... But David, the Bible said, when they were bringing the ark to the, to the to, uh, city of Jerusalem, the Bible says David danced with all his might. The Bible said, the next verse, he said he twirled. He twirled and danced. I mean, everything, I mean, everything he did was to show love for God. I think that's why God told all of us that he is a man after my own heart. You may mess up, but if you'll fess up, I'll clean your record. But I'm looking for those who have radical love for me. <laughs> radical love for me. And Jesus said, those who forgiven much, love much. I tell you this, you look back at where you've been, and you thank God for where you are, and you need to praise God for his goodness to you. He is a God that has blessed your life. He has forgiven you. He has helped you. I tell you, God, you're an awesome God. We give a shout to God. You're an awesome God. You live God. You should lo love, love God with all your emotions, everything in you. Don't do this, this praise like hallelujah. That's like a half-mass praise. Lift up the hands in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And one thing, hallelujah. And, and one thing I can't stand is this. Praise, praise the Lord. What is that? Lift up both hands to God. Glory be to God. So you got to be able to shout out to God. you got to give him everything out of your soul. And then the Bible says to love him with all your mind. All your mind. Now, this mind is like an incredible computer that makes every other computer in the world look sick. This computer can do more than any, than any other computer. It can store all the images, store all the sounds, store all the tastes and smells. Have you been to a place where you, you smell something that it, it took you right back? God is a God who wants our minds on Him. And you see... Because wherever your mind goes, that's where you go. If your mind is in the ditch, it'll take you in the ditch. 
If you think dark thoughts, you will end up doing dark things. You've got to take your thoughts. The Bible says you've got to think good thoughts, pure thoughts, praiseworthy thoughts. Philippians 4, 8. You've got to, on purpose, he tells you you can choose what you think. Did you know that? No, no, I'm sitting here and these thoughts come to mind. Spit them out if they're not of God. <laughs> Spit them out in Jesus' name. Don't entertain thoughts that are not of God. Understand the devil will throw you thoughts. You've got to learn how to take care of the devil's thoughts and throw them in the trash can. You've got to learn to do that. When you have a thought that's not of God, just say, excuse me. What did you do? I just spat a thought out in Jesus' name. <laughs> Get some action with it. But your thoughts are like a grappling hook that you put on a gun. You shoot it, boom, there's a rope behind you. Lands up on that cliff face. You get that rope, you start pulling yourself up, you'll end up where that grappling hook is. As a man thinketh, so, so that man becomes. So you've got to understand this. God gave you choices. So to, live, to love God with all your mind, the Bible says, out of Isaiah 26.3, he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Colossians 3.2, it says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Set your mind on the realities of heaven, not the things that are inconsequential on this earth. Amen. And I know what that's like, because my, my mother passed when she was 50. And one of the great healings to me, which we give the same thing, people, if you lose a loved one, hopefully you've already got this. If not, we'll give it to you. We give them books on heaven. But the more I read about heaven, the more I read about the streets of gold, the more I read about people being there in the houses, I wanted to go there so bad. But you know what? It gave me peace because I knew my mother was taken care of. And I tell you this, you've got to start thinking that way. Think about where you're going. Think of what God has for you. Always think heavenly thoughts. Think, think of where you're headed. Don't put your tent pegs too deep in this earth. You're leaving this earth. You're only here temporarily. Your real house is in heaven. So you've got to watch your thoughts. You've got to think thoughts. And let me, and let me tell you about God. God's thoughts, the Bible says, are beyond our thoughts. You've got to stretch to catch up with God. How about this for a thought? God knows your end from your beginning. He knows how your life's going to end up, and you don't. Well, I thought we have free will. You do. It's called an antinomy. What's that? Two truths never meet. God knows what you do before you do it, but you have free will. Well, how does that work? I don't know. Ask God. But God, let me tell you what, is very smart. He knows things before you can even know them. He can, he can, have you ever been through a certain, th something in your life, and you're kind of like, wait a minute, this is unbelievable how this all worked out. How did this happen? But with God's planning, he must have known this before, and he set it up for you to walk into. I remember I was raised in Africa. I'm an African in a white man's body. <laughs> but I was raised in Africa all my all my playmates in the early days were Africans. That's why I go to Africa more than any other continent. But we had an uh, issue. When my parents came to the main mission house, this house was built in, like in the mid-1800s, a typical mission house in Africa. Red tin roof, white plaster walls. And Africa lived in our house. We had every kind of creature living in our house, but we got, but, but we got used to it. So I remember they had a problem with their money. And my dad and mom told me, listen, the, the people before us, they left us in the red. And they had never balanced the books. They didn't have Sister Flossie there. And the thing was in arrears by quite a substantial amount. And how are we going to get this money? How are we going to get solvent? Now think about this. As a boy, I got this. They were digging in the wall because they were rebuilding one of the rooms. And they found in the wall itself... It was plastered over a tin, like a box, tin box. They pulled it out, dusted it off, opened it up. It's full of money. Who puts money in a tin box, sticks it in the mission house wall? How did it get there? We don't care. Let's look at the money. <laughs> they, they counted that money. And my dad came to tell me, he said, this is a miracle. I said, what's that? The amount in the box is the same amount that we owe. Now think about this. God saw the need, 
had some crazy guy put some money in a box, <laughs> stick it in a wall, cover it over so no one will see it, then at the right time, dig it out, and it will match the need. Come on now. What? What? Only God can pull that off. So when you talk about the mind of God, you got a lot of catching up to do. But God wants us to focus our minds on Him. You got to watch your mind. When you're studying the Bible, your mind will wander, you got to bring it back. Listen, when you're worshiping, if, 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 if you get off, while I'm, even while I'm preaching, and I'll give you an excuse for this, the way you get yourself back on track is you take this hand and you move it as far away from your head as possible. Then you bring it to your face with ever increasing velocity like this and just slap yourself and say, stop that in Jesus' name and your mind will come back around. Amen. You gotta, be, you gotta watch your mind. Spit out the thoughts that are not of God. If you get anything out of this sermon, if someone sees you go, they know, what's, well, they know what's going on. And it's okay, we understand. Your mind, your mind. And then the God says, with all your strength. With all your strength. You know what? It takes strength to serve God. If you want to get wore out, go back there and deal with 12 or 14 kids in a room. And you've got to keep them entertained and share the gospel and preach. And do things that, like, but I love kids. I love them. Once I, back there, I was teaching. I was teaching. I had little ones around me. I was teaching about the armor of God. And this kid is about four. He's part of our church now. He's, he's, I won't mention his name. He'd be embarrassed. But he's four. And so he says, wait a minute. I said, what? He, he ran across the room, jumped up on the counter or the sink, stood up, on, reached a box that was on the top. I hadn't seen it. He pulled it down. It has a little plastic armor. He st- all of a sudden, he got into this helmet thing. He put his helmet on. He put his thing. He put everything on. And he said, is, is this what you mean? That's what I mean, son. That's what I mean. It's not quite plastic, but that's good enough for me. So you just understand, he, there's, there's things he needs you to do. And there's, like, God wants you to, to do things in excellence. And so when you go to work, give it everything you got. Because you do it out of love for him. When you go for a mission trip, you want to say, God, I need the strength to carry this in Jesus' name. And I got young bucks with me. But they, uh, I give them a run for their money, trust me. Trust me. Well, he said, well, listen, old man, you can't, no, no, Roger, I'm the one carrying the pack, and I'm the one running, showing them how to do it. <laughs> you know why? Because they said, God, I want energy. I want, I want energy. And I don't drink Red Bulls. Because <laughs> I went to my doctor, I got my, this is about three years ago, I, got, I went to a, getting a medical checkup, my, and, and, he, and he says, my gosh, your blood pressure is real high. I says, never, it's always normal. He said, were you driving through Atlanta traffic drinking Red Bull? <laughs> That's exactly what he said. I was doing both those things. I was driving through Atlanta traffic and drinking Red Bull. I said, I quit, I quit that. I can't go that high. But my point is this. With all your strength, and if you put those all together, they're, they're, they're just like superlatives. All of your spirit, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, I want you to love me. There's something in those words that says you got to be passionate about God. There's something that says i got to want God. i got to love God. i got to worship God. I've got I to get to know God. If we can keep that commandment, everything else would fall in line. Because our issue is we don't. But let me ask this question. Why do we love God? Why should I love God? Well, first of all, because he's a good God. He's a good God. God is good. Scripture abounds on this. He says, the goodness of God endures continually. That's Psalm 52, uh, verse 1. Psalm 118, 29. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Psalm 135, 3. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. I love this. Psalm 143, 10 says, for you are my God, and your spirit is good. You know, some of you have a good spirit. You ever seen a good spirit person? Greg Griffith is a man with a great spirit. He's got the hospitality spirit like I've never seen anybody. He'll invite the world to his house if he lets him. <laughs> but he's got a big spirit. He's just got a great spirit. There's somebody who's just, you're looking at him, he's got a great spirit. God's got a great spirit. God is a good, God's a good God. And he says about himself in James 1.17, because the Bible is written by God. He said, every good and perfect gift, James 1.17, every good and perfect gift. Every good and every perfect. There's no other kind. 
That comes from heaven. Every good, every perfect. No cancer comes from heaven. No colds come from heaven. The flu is never from heaven. You've never heard of the heavenly flu yet. It's always the Hong Kong flu. <laughs> the Chinese flu. It's always something out in Asia. Some other kind of weird flu. No, because there's no flu to send down. None. And so you've got to understand this, that he said, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Look what the Passion says, streaming down from the lights of heaven. In whom there is no variance or shadow of turning. What does that mean? That God, you'll never find God doing wrong things against you. You'll never find him in the shadows. Not that God would ever be in the shadows, but in the shadows trying to do something evil against you. It's not his nature. He's just a good God. He said, if your fathers know how to give good things to your children, how much more, how much more, how much more will your heavenly father give good things to those who love him? I tell you this, God's a good God. You got to get that in your spirit, how good he is. But then not only is he a good God, he's a great God. God likes to announce, and I like to read the prophets, and he's constantly announcing. I always get tickled with this just so God is just letting you know who you're dealing with. He's not your next door neighbor. I am the Lord that made heaven and earth. I just want you to know who you're dealing with. I made heaven and earth. I made you. Sometimes we think we're like, our problem is we start thinking like we're God. We're not God. We're sons of God. He's the only God. There's only one God. And then we get into this whole thing about how big he is. Scriptures abound. Scriptures say things like this. Who has measured, out of Isaiah 40, verse 12, the waters or the seas of the oceans in the hollow of his hand. That's pretty big. Who's measured out heaven with the span. The span is nine inches. From the tip of your thumb to the tip of your little finger is a span. God measures his heaven with a span. That's a big hand. And then the Bible goes on to say that it calculates the dust of the earth in a measure and weighs the mountain and scales and the hills in a balance. What kind of God is this? Mount Everest, how much does he weigh? God knows. What kind of scales you have to have to weigh Mount Everest? And then he goes on to say all, this is for the UN if they're watching, <laughs> all the nations of the world are a drop in a bucket in compared to his greatness. He says, and he goes on the next verse, he's not done yet. He said, the nations of the world are like the dust on a scale. He's big. I believe, this may wrap your head around it, it's just a science thing. Let's, swept, let's switch to the natural. As they keep seeing the universe getting bigger, I believe there's no end to it. How could that be? I'm telling you, we serve a God that's far bigger than we want to make him. We've got to get over the how little we make him. He's a bigger God than you could ever imagine. He's a great God, a great God, and this greatness of God is as great as he is, so great is his love for you. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the love toward those who fear him. God has a love that you cannot measure. Paul put it this way. Oh, that you'd get a hold of the length, breadth, height, depth, the level of God. God loves you beyond what you can even imagine. It'll take heaven. I love that verse in Ephesians 2. It will take eternity. How do you know eternity is a long time? I'm being a little facetious. Eternity is forever. But he said it would take eternity for God to reveal the mercy he showed you through Jesus Christ. Meaning that there'll be always an unveiling of more and more and more of his love because his love is without end. It's fathomless. There's no end to it. So he calls you and I to understand the greatness of his love because he is a God of love and he loves you. And I don't care where you are today in this whole sermon. You're saying, well, I'm having issues with making God the first... Because uh, i got a lot of stuff going on. But i got some good news for you. God sent his son. 1 John 4, 9. In this, the love of God was manifested. That he sent his only begotten son. That we might live through him. You see, God sent his son for you. That can eradicate all the things that separate you from his love. And I want to say this up front on this first of the year. We welcome every person that says, I'm a sinner. Because I want to tell you this. 
All of us have sinned. No one's better than anybody else. We all have had, had to apply the blood of Christ to us. Therefore, we accept every person here, including those from every kind of lifestyle in Atlanta that we know about. We're going to love them. Because God loves them, and we're going to, and I'll tell you what, we don't accept their behavior, but we accept their person as a creator, as a creation of Almighty God. And I tell you this, there should be no condemnation in this house, no guilt in this house. We welcome those that have failed. We welcome those that have sinned. Because when you come to Jesus, he will cleanse you of your sin if you repent. Yes, he'll wash you clean. He'll make it brand new. And I tell you, the church should be a place of hope for a new beginning for anybody who comes. So don't anybody say, I'm from World Harvest Church and you got a bony Pharisee finger. Please put it back in your holster. And we don't do that around here in the mighty name of Jesus. But you see, God is so, he's a God of such great love. And I tell you, I, I, I got to think about this. I was writing my notes. I, I just couldn't get all my notes on the page. I started writing about the goodness of God. That he, we get to call him Abba Father. That means a daddy. I get to call you daddy. You're my papa. Oh, that's sacrilegious. No, really, it's what he wants out of us. He wants us to get to know him so well that we have fellowship with God. God calls us fellowship with him. The word fellowship means koinonia. He's called us to have fellowship with God. First uh, Corinthians, I believe it is um, 1, 4. He says, God is faithful by which you were called into the fellowship of his son. Jesus Christ. God wants to bless you. God wants you to know that I'm telling you this. He wants to prosper you in Jesus' mighty name. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich. He has no sorrow with it. Proverbs 10. That God has one thing in his mind to bless your life. And all he wants out of you is to love him, not the stuff. He says, can you love me? Just not the stuff. You can have the stuff, but don't love the stuff. Love me. He says, I will give you anything you need. He says, I will prosper you. It says about Uzziah. Uzziah the king. Way back there in Chronicles. He says, the Bible says he lived to 52 years of age. He was the longest reigning king in Israel. And this man was blessed. And the Bible says, as long as he sought the Lord, God caused him to prosper. As long as he loved God, God's caused a blessing. That's why I'm saying the first key is love God. First key is love God above everything else. Make up your mind that you're going to love God in the morning, love God at night. Make up your mind. Make up your mind you're going to get some praise, worship, and stuff going on in your car or in your house. Make up your mind you're going to spend time with God on a daily basis. Make up your mind that church will not be a side issue, but it'll become the issue because you love God, because you want to show God your love, because you want to grow your love. And I promise you this, the more you press into God, the more you press into you. He said, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. That's, a, that's a James 4.8. And there's a thing you got to do. I'm going to say, God, I want you. I want to love like you. I want to grow in my love for you. I don't want to stay where I am. I want to get more intense. I want to get more radical. I want to get more passionate. I want to do more. I want to go more. I want to give more. I want to worship more. I want to praise more. Amen. I tell you, it's the heart of every believer that's in you. But I tell you, you got to understand, that's the first commandment. It's the greatest commandment that you love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. That you love God. And anything that takes away from that, cut out of your life. Change your habits. Change what you do. If you love God, you love his word. If you love God, you love the house of God. If you love God, you love to serve in the house of God. I'm telling you, there's a move of God in this house. People are going to get more and more radical in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and going for the Lord Jesus. So everything flows out of that scripture. He's so wonderful. I've got so many scriptures. I, I could have written down 20 that say the same thing. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Oh, he is merciful. He is kind. He's so kind that he let his rain fall on Hitler's backyard and Mussolini. God will let his rain sh fall on the, on the good and the evil because he's just trying to bless people. He wants to help people turn to him. Amen? So we've got to love him. Love him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. 
Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. I'll close with this because I need to. <laughs> God loves you so, so much. He loves you. He loves you. And all he asks of you that you love him back. I was talking about Jesus this first sermon. How Jesus is like this, he's not the way so many portray him, especially the artists from the Middle Ages. He is like this cool Jesus. He's cool. I think Jesus laughed. I think he cut up. I think he gave. I, I, and I'll take you to the very end where Jesus has risen from the dead and the, the disciples have seen him a couple of times, but then Peter gets frustrated. You know, rambunctious Peter. He says, I go fishing. We don't know where Jesus is. He keeps scaring us by walking through the door. <laughs> ah, peace be to you. I, I love Jesus. He, he likes to just to pull your leg a little bit. Why can't you knock on the door and come through the door? Not Jesus, right through the wall. <laughs> so they're out there. Now get this. The sun is just coming up. The lake is like glass. And these guys have been fishing all night. They're frustrated. Jesus shows up. Resurrected body. Now think about this. He said he, there, there was a fire there with fish. He said, how did that happen? Like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and he's sitting there as he watched him struggle. And you know, Jesus is cool. He doesn't say, hey guys. This is the Son of God, Almighty Jesus, raised from the dead. Hello. But no, he's just on the slide. He's sitting there, got the, got the fire going. And he knows they're watching. And I, you, you don't think that, who's that guy up there? I don't know. What's he got a fire going on? He's cooking breakfast on the beach. Who is that guy? I don't know. Just keep fishing. Hey. The voice bounces up the water. They can hear him. Throw your net out on the other side of the boat. They don't know it's Jesus yet. Who is that guy? I don't know. We've got nothing else to do. Let's throw it on the other side of the boat. They drag that big old net out, throw the other side of the boat. All of a sudden, the fish come running from everywhere and fill up the net. And they said, who is that guy? Finally, uh, one, of the, one of the disciples said, it's the Lord. Peter, in his excitement. You know, he's down to his skivvies. The Bible said he just jumped in the water. He just jumps in. He's radical. And starts swimming as only Peter could swim. Don't forget, he didn't walk on water. I doubt he could swim very well either. I promise you that. <laughs> he was just flashing his way over there. Then he gets out soaking wet. And Jesus is looking at him. He said, Jesus is just so cool. He said, you want some fish here? Sit down. Dry yourself off. He said, bring the rest of the fish. They bring the fish. He says, how many you got? 153. You all sit down there. Now watch this. They're eating and they're checking out Jesus. What is with Jesus? But he's so, so cool. And then he tells Peter, come with me. Peter's walking. He's still wet. Yes. Peter, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, I love you. And he uses the word agape. Do you love me with unconditional love? He couldn't say yes. The second time he says, I want you to feed my lambs, Peter, if you love me. And he, and he couldn't answer that agape. It's too strong. So Jesus, because he's cool, lowers the strength of the word from agape the third time to phileo. Can you love me as a friend? He said, yes, Lord. Now let me tell you what happened to Peter. He fulfilled the first commandment the rest of his life. Jesus prophesied that he would die. And history tradition says that, church tr tradition said he, he was hung upside down. He was crucified. But not only he, but every other of the apostles, other than the, uh, the apostle John, they all died a martyr's death. 
Can I tell you why they died that death? Because the first commandment was their first and great commandment. They say, Jesus, your love, loving you, my love is so great. If I have to, I'll give you my life. Because you gave your life for me. And he asks you, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me enough to lay down your life for me? Do you love me enough to obey what I'm asking you to do? Do you love me enough to give what I tell you to give? Do, I, do you love me enough? It's a matter of love. When you get the first commandment right, everything else comes right. Amen? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And it's the key to your increase in 2020. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today that you have given us instruction on how to follow you. You told us to love you with everything within us, to love you with passion, to love you with focus, to love you with concentration, that, Lord, we won't get sidelined by the distractions of life and the business of our world, but we're going to focus on Jesus. We're going to focus on our Father. We're going to focus on what the Spirit of the Lord would say. Now, Lord, we want to have a life that's consumed with pleasing you, focused on you, living for you, if you're here in this place and you would have to say you're here because you are wanting God to touch your life but perhaps you're here and there's stuff in your life you know is wrong and you don't feel good about it but you're not sure what to do with it I'm here to tell you today here's what you need to do about it you need to understand God's got a way for you a way out but he needs you to get real with him and confess your sins to him and repent and let him begin a new work in your heart some relationships need to be broken because they are not taking you before towards God. They're taking you away from God. Some habits need to be broken because they're taking you away from God. So if you're here today on the sound of my voice and you know you don't have peace with God, but you want to have peace, this is for you. Or if you're here, you've never received Christ as your Savior. You came with a friend. Jesus is here to show you His love. He doesn't condemn you. He just wants to let you know He loves you and He will forgive you of your sin if you'll admit to them and turn from them. So if you're here under the sound of my voice and either to come to Christ to give Him your heart and life or to come back to Christ to have peace back in your heart and make it right with Him. If that's you, on a count to three, raise your hand. In the balcony, on the floor. One, it's between you and God, not between you and me. Two, it's talking about coming into the family of God, not this family of this church. It's the family of God we're talking about. And when I say three, raise your hand. Get ready. Let the Holy Spirit direct you, but just obey Him. Three, raise your hand. That's you. Yeah, that's me. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for another hand. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. All over this place, they're being raised. Up in the balcony. In the name of Jesus. I got a hand over there. Thank you. Another hand over there keep raising them. This is beautiful. This is wonderful. This is what it's all about. If God's prompted you. Just raise your hand. Now I'll do what I said I promised I would do. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you at your seat. But here's what I want you to do. If you just stand to your seat to say, I want to stand in faith and I will pray for you from this platform. Go over the place. If you raise your hand quickly, just stand up. Don't even hesitate. Just stand up. Just stand. As, 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 as heads are bowed, eyes are closed, just, just stand in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Keep standing. If you are raise your hand, just go ahead and stand. Just make it a decision. Why do you make this to do that? Because you've got to show a little faith to God. You've got to show that you mean business. That's why. Amen? I want everybody to say this prayer. Those standing and those seated. Say, oh God, I want to be a lover of God. I want to fulfill the first commandment. I want to love you with everything in me. But Lord, sin has separated me from your presence. So today, on purpose, intentionally, I repent of my sins. I turn my back on all sin. I turn my back on this world. And today I declare Jesus Christ, 
as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again for me. And I'm now receiving you and your forgiveness into my life. I am born again. I am born of your spirit. I'm washed clean by your blood. In Jesus' mighty name, I thank you, Lord. I'm yours. Amen. Now let's all stand to our feet, shall we? Everybody stand together. And uh, I want to ask this question. How many of you in this place here today would say, just with the honest raised hand, Pastor, God spoke to me in this sermon, and I want to come up in loving God. Raise your hand. Say, I want to come up. Hands everywhere. That's wonderful. The second crowd was so much better than the first. First crowd had two people raise their hand. I felt like hitting rewind and preaching it all over again. It wasn't two, but it was a very small amount. I said, well, okay. But I appreciate the heart that's shown by raising your hand. So we're going to go to prayer. I want to pray for you. Just lift your hands up to God. Father, I pray for everyone here today, especially those who raise their hands. God, they want something new fresh wind of fire, fresh passion for the things of God. They want to measure everything they do by their love for you. And so, Lord, we make these confessions. Say it out of your mouth. Say, oh God, I am determined this year by the grace of Almighty God, by the movement of the Holy Spirit, by the fire of the Holy Spirit, that you burn out of me all self-centeredness, distractions, and things that cause me to be weak in loving you. But I make a determination to love you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, with all of my strength, that everything I defer to you, that I put you first in all my decision making, and that my time will be your time, and everything I do will be to glorify you because I love you, because I want to please you. So do a work in my heart, oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a shout. Glory! Uh, now let me just say this. Don't miss next key. It takes five keys. It's like a combination. You need to get the first combo. You need the second combo. Next week, bring friends in Jesus' name. Amen? We say, hey, man, we're getting keys how to increase. Do you want to increase? Yeah, I'm going to increase. Come to the service in Jesus' name. Amen? Come on, Pastor Willie. Amen. If you raised your hand, Pastor Merrick's going to be standing right down here in front. He really wants to shake your hand and just, just pray with you one more time. So if you raised your hand, I want you to make sure that when the service is over, you come down and have an opportunity to meet with him. And if you need prayer for anything, we have some elders and some deacons that will pray with you and for you. They'll be right down here in front. Make sure you don't leave the same way that you came in. Get some agreement in prayer. Amen? Don't forget to continue to pray. God's doing some supernatural, some great things. We got a revival coming up on Sunday evening. It's in the bulletin there. So take a look at that. Make sure you read your bulletin in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, your kindness towards us. Lord, we choose to believe, oh God, that we're going to learn to love you more. Thank you, God, that you loved us first and that you're drawing us into your presence. We'll forever be grateful, God, to what you've done in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Also, we have a guest reception. If you're a first-time guest with us, right out through those doors, down the hallway to the left, there's a guest reception. We'd love to meet with you. Just have a quick cup of coffee and shake your hand. Amen? Amen. Pastor's going to be standing right there. He'd love to shake your hand if you prayed that prayer today.